How are you doing, Nicole? You're okay? So just a quick one, yeah. So how are you doing, Nicole? You're okay? So that means the recording is live. Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for joining in this session today. So let's make a quick start with regards to learning outcome four. Learning outcome four, uh, we are looking at today covering the impact of change on tourism and hospitality sector. Yesterday's learning outcome from uh, three was also impact of current trends. But today what we are looking at is uh, specifically discussing change uh, in tourism and hospitality management. Now, there are three things that we are looking at. One is trends. What are the factors? And the third, what are the impacts? So essentially looking at yesterday's learning outcome, what we were looking at covering yesterday was the impact of current trends. So trends will be covered in a bit more detail here today when we look at uh, discussing things which are related to things like how ownership is changing or how people are looking at now taking holidays, proper point of view of you know, ownership. So in particular, the example of Airbnb that we want to look at in terms how people are looking at costs, saving costs, and obviously having more personalized experience with regards to holidaying or when they go on a vacation. And then the second part would be looking at factors, how sometimes pandemics, natural disasters, or, you know, act of God, as we call them, how does that affect, you know, the uh, travel, tourism and hospitality industry? So things like decline in sales, recession, you know, exchange rate fluctuation, look at natural disasters, epidemics, pandemics, you know, those are the kind of uh, factors which can, you know, affect how tourism actually, uh, you know, tourism and tourism and activity, how does it grow or, you know, fall within a particular location or a region. And then the impact in terms of uh, increased tourism activities, putting a lot of pressure on economic side of, uh, in, environmental side of factors, things like, you know, transportation, pollution, looking at accommodation, retailing space for, uh, you know, retail or hotels and resorts to come up. And obviously requirement of things like super aircrafts, bigger, uh, you know, container ships in terms of, uh, you know, when we look at cruises and low cost airlines. So there are lots of uh, bits and pieces which could have different forms of impact. They might not be connected directly with the tourism and hospitality sector, but in general, this impact could be uh, uh, indirect impact on the tourism and hospitality sector because of the changes, development and issues which are being faced in other sectors like construction, housing, uh, you know, look at engineering production, um, you know, retailing service, financial services, things like that. And how does this particular uh, get impact, uh, indirect, have an indirect impact on the tourism and hospitality industry? Now, there are two assessment criteria, 4.1 and 4.2. In the first one, we are looking at how tourism and the hospitality organizations are responding to these changes and trends in terms of factors. And the second is, the impact of these issues and trends and what kind of change is it forcing the companies to do, organizations to do within this particular uh, sector. So two assessment criteria that we are looking at and we'll cover that uh, using a PowerPoint presentation. So I've created a deck of new slides which will primarily be focused on covering these two assessment criteria in the learning outcome uh, four. Uh, that's the content that I would basically go through. And I've created a few examples or some paragraphs about the key trends, key factors, and key impact. Towards the end of the presentation, I've put some, um, you know, additional reading articles, which I would suggest that you should read through. One is the case for change management in hospitality industry. It's a very good article on the Forbes uh, website. Then there is another one, which is tourism dependent economies are amongst the most harmed by the pandemic. So this is a retrospective article that you might want to go in and read, which will basically, uh, which is published on the International Monetary Fund website. And this is a compiled report, which basically talks about the impact of, uh, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic on the tourism industry. So it could be a very good reading. It's a, it's a PDF document that you can also download and I will provide that on Moodle. There are bits and pieces, which is uh, again, a good article, which has been published it talks about the changes in hospitality industry. What are the new paradigms, frames, and perspectives which, which we get to see? There is something which is called the Tourism 2040, Tourism 2030. That's a good handout. And it will give you a perspective on how changes are going to happen in this industry in the future. 
There is a good website that I stumbled onto, which is Hospitality Insights. And this talks about a brief history of hospitality. There are a number of good topics that you'll be able to read through uh, in order to cover this particular unit. Some of them are relevant, but it is more so from a point of view of um, you know, getting background and knowledge about hospitality and tourism industry in general. So it's a good article which you could read. There are a couple of hyperlinks in that. And when you read through them, what you're going to be able to see is that it will take you in a stepwise fashion in terms of the trends in tourism industry, how tourism industry is involved, what is destination management, and give you some good ideas and uh, you know good uh, information into some of the key concepts within this sector. And last but not the least, we can't escape uh, climate change, which is affecting the hospitality industry. So there's a particular article, uh, you know, which talks about how climate change will essentially be looking at, um, you know, affecting, um, you know, let's say, um, uh, you know, the tourism and hospitality industry. And that is something which I would suggest that you could also read through. And these are for additional reading at some stage with regards to, um, I would say, uh, you know, covering learning outcome four. So this bit is uh, coming a bit later, but what we'll delve into first is primarily looking at a, a video that I picked up on YouTube, and it talks about technologies for senior living. That means people who are living, um, you know, who are essentially, um, uh, let's say, uh, it's a perspective. I think it was a keynote which basically talks about the impact of robotics, Internet of Things, and video analytics predominantly, you know, within um, the, uh, you know, industry today and in general, the um, tourism and hospitality sector. So what I want to do is primarily just play this video um, and for you to have a quick look at in terms of um, getting some knowledge into because of the fact that when we talk about... Uh, how you can generate all these ad creatives Sorry. So when we, in general, talk about you know the, um, uh, let, let's say the trends, uh, issues, and factors which are shaping up, uh, you know the, uh, let's say the, um, um, you know the hospitality sector. When I say how hotels, how resorts, how hotel chains, or tour operators, or essentially people who run small you know, businesses within this particular sector, and this is their livelihood. How is it that uh, this is changing in general when we look at uh, this particular outlook? So what I want to do is play a particular video. And this particular video, we are not going to go through in detail uh, in the full, but what we want to be able to do is essentially see how um, and where is, um, uh, you know, we get a bit of perspective in terms of how this would be um, how hospitality industry in general, how hotels in general are actually using, you know, the um, technology uh, to make things more efficient or make things more workable uh, while providing and keeping quality, uh, you know, in mind for, for the purposes of, uh, you know, uh, customer and customer satisfaction. So let me uh, pause this for a second in the video and then I'm going to play and switch you over. This talks about, uh, you know, the Hospitality Summit, which is a summit uh, which was hosted by Boston University. And this particular summit, uh, you know, had some keynotes. There are lots of keynotes in this, but this one in particular that I'm going to show you uh, is going to be useful primarily because this is what relates to our learning outcome that we want to discuss and uh, you know talk about. So this particular uh, video is what we are looking at playing. Although there are a couple of other videos in the summit which which are very good topics, but I'm focused on the technology part of it, which is where the trends, factors, and impact is being seen. And what we want to do is basically go through this to get a perspective. Now there are other videos in this, which I have included in the references section of the presentation today. And they are good videos for you to watch simply because it will give you a perspective in terms of where the hospitality industry is generally going and how uh, changes are happening with this industry, what uh, changes are being embraced, what are changes which are good, what are changes which are bad. And in some cases, you know, how do we look at digitization, which is a topic that we touched on yesterday is happening within this sector. So let me just play this video um, for a minute 
and then we we are going to see a couple of minutes of this video rather than the full video uh, with regards to going through this uh, this is super exciting and thank you Emma, for that introduction uh i'm having a lot of fun and i'm super excited to be here on stage with these uh, esteemed speakers from all over the world giving all these unique perspectives are you guys having fun okay that's great awesome that's that's the most important thing today and uh let's see if the robots so you're able to hear this clearly and see it okay you're able to see the video and hear it i've just paused it for a second just to double check with you yeah okay having fun hey timmy are you having fun I had a great time with this audience at Boston University. Okay. Thank you for inviting me. Hope to see some of you soon. All right, so I think we need some empathy in this robot, right? You guys agree? All right, we talked about empathy this last go around, so we'll, we'll work on that. But uh, before I get started, you know, this is very personal for me. Uh, you know, two of my cousins went to BU, and when Leora reached out to me and said, hey, can you come talk about robotics and this fourth industrial revolution? It just, you know, I just felt like I had to do it. So uh, I'm excited to be here. And uh, we're going to talk about the fourth industrial revolution, which is robotics and AI. But the first thing I want to ask everyone is, how many of you, just show of hands, have either interacted with a robot and or AI in some form? All right. So I was expecting to see all the, hand, all the hands go up, because believe it or not, we've all interacted with AI uh, in some form or the other, whether it's Alexa, whether it's, you know, dealing with uh, some of the apps uh, that are, you know, monitoring what you're doing. AI is everywhere. So um, why don't we jump in? Uh, I have this slide up um, because every time I talk about robotics, the first question I get asked is, hey, a robot's going to take over the world. AI is going to take over our jobs. What are we going to do? And a good uh, friend of mine who was a professor said, this is this quote, uh, you know, we should celebrate when robots take over jobs because the jobs that they're taking over were dull and repetitive and mundane and no one wanted to do it. So the key takeaway here for me is the human element, the person-centered element of our business, which is hospitality, will never go away with robots or AI. It's just not going to happen. Uh, what robots will help us do is get more efficient. They're going to help us uh, become more productive and help us focus more on what we really love to do, which is taking care of our customers. We talked about uh, employees being at the center of uh, everything that we do. I truly believe that because if you don't have an, a happy employee, you don't have happy customers. So I just want to put this up there and get it over with. Robots are not going to take over the world. AI is not going to take over your jobs. But it does have a place, and it is going to transform the world we live in, whether we like it or not. So it's here. Uh, and that is the fourth uh, uh, revolution that we're going to see when it comes to uh, a huge technological shift. So a little bit of a history lesson. I think we can all look backwards before we look forwards. Uh, so if you look at history, there's sort of been four major shifts, right? The first one started off with the use of water and steam. Uh, you know, the second, second and third were actually the Industrial Revolution, where you had uh, mass production followed by automated production and computing and electronics. That was the third one. But the fourth one that's coming our way, it's already here, is the use of robotics and AI, which is going to, in my mind, personally, I feel that's the biggest shift we're going to see going forward, not just in hospitality, but in any industry, but especially in hospitality. And that's what I'm going to touch upon today. So let's see how far we've come since the 14th century. So if you look at this slide, you're going to see that Back in the 14th century, people were sketching robots. 
Now, I didn't think Da Vinci was going to sketch a robot. I was thinking like Nostradamus would be thinking about this stuff, right? I never expected Da Vinci to sketch a robot. But then fast forward, you've got, you know, in the 1930s, you had the first robotic toy. The Japanese were already thinking about it. And then you get into sort of the last two decades, and you see sort of the shift from mechanical robots, more the util utilitarian robots, to more of these intelligent robots. And that's where you have robots such as this one here uh, coming into being, where it's more intelligent. It can recognize faces. It can uh, see what your expressions are like. It can talk to you using natural language processing. So that's the kind of shift that we're seeing. The other interesting thing about the slide is that you see that things are evolving a lot faster as you get into the last few decades. So for example, from 1495 to the 90s, there was very few changes in robotics. But then from the 90s to now, you're seeing all kinds of robots evolve. So for example, I don't know how many of you have heard of this robotic seal that they were using in Japan for people with Alzheimer's. So this seal could sense depression. It would help with motivation. And all you had to do is pet the seal. And the seal was called Paro. Now since then, there have been robots such as Pepper, which is hands and legs. In fact, I played with Pepper. And one of the things I realized, apart from the fact that it cost $75,000, is that you needed a team of like 10 data scientists to make it work. So I was like, OK, we need a better way to do this. This is where Hello Guard comes in. So Hello Guard was sort of born uh, after me spending five years in senior living, where I realized that there had to be a better way to fight uh, the labor crisis. And there had to be more cost-effective technology to be able to address uh, the void that existed in the labor market. Um, in the senior living industry, there was employers were grappling with trying to get staff. Employees were leaving. The great resignation is real. 20% of the staff are never going to come back to this industry. And we've seen this across many industries. We see it in the restaurant industry where people don't want to work the morning shift. Uh, you know, people are leaving because they feel like there's better options. Uh, and, and we really needed to figure out how to solve this problem. And one of the bigger problems that I was seeing in the industry is that there was a need for real-time data. And what do I mean by that? So we have all these data silos, but I can't just ask uh, using voice, you know, what is my occupancy today? You know, what, what, what kind of staffing level do I need? How much time is a caregiver spending with a resident? I need that data at my fingertips, and I had no way to get that. So that's how Hello Guard was born. We wanted to be a cloud-based work, workflow solution that helped solve for these operational challenges. And we wanted to focus primarily on senior living and healthcare. So, so the vision here was to create one platform on a robot that would allow us to face these labor challenges head on and provide the same quality of care through efficiency and provide staff with tools to lessen the burnout rate and to allow them to spend more time caregiving and doing what they love rather than taking people's temperatures or checking them in. Um, that was the whole idea behind Hello Guard. So this is a story I like to tell because uh, this is a story of our partner, Temi. And this is why Temi was born. And here's the story. So if you think of tremors, it's a common problem. In fact, so common that 2.2% of the population have that problem. And trying to have a person hold a cup of tea that's 80 years old or navigate a tablet on a FaceTime call is really difficult because they, their hands shake and it's not a very good experience. Uh, so Yossi Wolf, good friend of mine, co-founder of Temi, actually built Temi 
because his grandmother couldn't hold a cup of tea and drink it and operate her phone. That's how Temi was born. So what is Temi? Temi is the world's first personal assistant robotics platform. And you're going to get to witness her. We're going to have some fun with her uh, in a little bit. Uh, but it was designed to adapt to any setting to address various operational workflow challenges. The key word here is that it's a platform, so you can build on top of it. A robot is not going to solve your problem. You always have to start with the question, what is it that we're trying to solve, and then work backwards to build that workflow to solve that issue. So this is a quick slide to show you some of the success that Temi has had. It's, uh, you know, in, uh, we've got 3.2 million followers, 12 million website visitors, and uh, over 240,000 subscribers. So it has been around the world and has gotten a lot of publicity as well. So this is more of a macro look at how Temi is being used in various verticals. So we're seeing a lot of interest, for example, you know, a large mall operator came to me and said, hey, Sanjeev, I need a solution where people can go up to this kiosk or robot and ask it questions about where certain stores are. And we're building a solution for that. So that's the retail uh, use case. Uh, we have healthcare has seen a surge in telehealth. In fact, it's up 300%. Um, they're using our solution for telehealth. So this thing can connect to like a blood pressure cuff, a weighing scale, a glucometer. So now doctors are able to do more rounding in healthcare facilities. Uh, doctors anywhere in the world can connect to a patient. Sometimes we joke and say, listen, if there was Wi-Fi on the moon, you could go hang out in the moon and run around the moon, right, using this robot. Uh, but if you look at hospitality, there's also a use case for this robot to act as a front desk agent. So it can check you in, take your temperatures, if you're wearing a mask, guide you to your room. Um, I was just talking to Mark around earlier, and he was like, you know, how cool would it be if Temi could do a guided tour of our school instead of sending someone a YouTube video? I'm like, yeah, that's really cool. We can do that, right? Uh, so there's all kinds of use cases. But let's specifically look at senior living and healthcare um, and how we're helping them. So if you look at all these different use cases, the one that really stands out during the pandemic was the virtual family visits because through the use of this feature called telepresence, where you can be at two places at once, I can dial into this robot and go see my dad. And not only can I see my dad, I'm actually in the room where he's sitting, and not only am I in the room that he's sitting, I can now move around with him, with him and experience what he's experiencing. So we talked about experiences, we talked about memories. How cool would that be? And I don't have to step foot into his building. That's the nice thing about telepresence. And now I can even move the robot around so I could actually move with him, and he doesn't have to do anything. Um, now, obviously, there's you know, the hands-free assistance. There is the sales tours. There's marketing departments using our solution to uh, you know, tour prospects who can't make it into the building. There's a the remote learning aspect. You know, Friday night is bingo night. Guess what? If I can't go to uh, you know, a room, I just use my robot to uh, experience what the rest of the community is experiencing. Um, food delivery, analytics. So we're coming out with a food delivery robot in the next two months. And it's not just a robot that goes from point A to point B, but it's going to be interacting with you. So what if it's Leora's birthday, right? I deliver a cake and say, happy birthday, Leora. That's pretty cool, right? It's an experience. Uh, so Hello Guard has really been instrumental in helping in the daily lives of providers and staff. So here's a sample planner. So our solution doesn't just sit there. It actually does something. It's doing something for the community daily, checking people in, doing sales tours. 
It's working with family members, connecting them to their loved ones. It's working with residents on interactive games, talking to them. Um, it's amazing what natural language processing and Google Dialogue Flow can do for, for people. You can literally talk to this robot and it will give you answers. And it's not like Alexa where you ask it what the weather is like. You actually get community-based content, which is part of our solution. So HelloGuard has been used a lot. We've got a lot of interest from airports. In fact, we'll be in four different airports this year. We're going to be in malls. Uh, we did start out in senior living, but we will rapidly move into other verticals as well. So to wrap up uh, this talk about the why, uh, primarily this was to address the staff burnout, but we also wanted to address uh, the great resignation. We wanted to empower employees to have tools that they could actually use uh, within their setting. Um, and I also felt uh, coming out of the senior living industry that I wanted to do something that really helped the industry. Uh, the industry was at a tipping point. They needed solutions. And I uh, founded HelloGuard to do that. And I wanted to bring purpose and joy back to seniors and patients as well. So now we're going to have some fun and actually meet Temi. So I am going to actually have Temi speak to you guys uh, by invoking her. And hopefully she'll come out and say a few words. Hello, BU Leadership Summit attendees from the School of Hospitality. My name is Temi, and I am part of the robot fleet of solutions provided by HelloGuard. Sanjeev asked me to join the summit, and I am honored to join this team of speakers from Google Travel, WeWork, Toast, Selena, Reef Technology, and the Culinary Edge. A little bit about me. I am an easy-to-use, affordable voice-enabled robot with 16 sensors on my frame that allow me to autonomously navigate myself around senior living and various settings. Healthcare and senior housing has evolved like never before, forcing providers to rethink staffing options and technology. My goal as part of the Hilo Guard mission is to bring joy by creating experiences that fit special needs and empower individuals and staff to thrive beyond expectations. I am able to be at the forefront of healthcare and helping with various programs at communities and homes to provide an added toolkit to virtually connect family members to their loved ones, provide simple voice-enabled Alexa commands, enhanced in-home AR and VR activities, screen visitors, and provide remote care. Since I am powered by HelloGuard, my AI skills enable facial recognition and the ability to navigate Thank you, Thank you. See you later. This capability allows me to check people in enable virtual training and meetings for staff, take interactive surveys, be an interactive knowledge base. So as you can see, I'm not going to go into a bit of detail right now because I think this video gives you a perspective in terms of how automation is coming. I have personally seen one or two such places wherein they have started to use auto robots essentially for the purposes of taking orders in restaurants or, you know, uh, in certain uh, places wherein they are able to assist you with check-in or, you know, some of the other bits uh, with regards to how technology is getting adapted into, you know, hotels. So um, this, there are a number of videos in this series. So if you copy and paste this link on the internet, should you wish to watch, I think it will be a good idea for you to look at these so that uh, they give you a perspective. And it was this particular conference only happened recently. So I think uh, it'll also give you updates and insights into uh, the latest things which are happening within the industry. Now, if I go into the key terminology of the learning outcome, the learning outcome says for this particular, uh, you know, the assessment, uh, learning outcome forces, understand the impacts of change on tourism. So when we look at the impact of change, one such change that we are seeing is because of technology. Um, this is something that we discussed very briefly yesterday. There are changes which are coming in because the industry has been asked to, um, you know, also look at embracing new concepts or new ideas or innovation within the sector. And this is coming in the form of eco-friendly accommodations. It is coming in the form of, you know, unique theme stays. 
I don't know how many of you have been to, say, for example, a uh, place like Disneyland or, you know, some of the other uh, destinations when you go to, uh, wherein if you have kids going along with you, what they would also then give you an option in some of these holiday resorts, as I call it, uh, would be wherein you have theme parks, water parks, you know, uh, theme parks like Disneyland and, you know, water parks, they would normally offer you an accommodation which is in a themed way. That means they have bunk beds or the environment itself as natural, uh, you know, in the nature or probably modern or, you know, going back to medieval times. And the idea is that they want to give you a look and feel of how, you know, uh, people would have traveled 20 years back or 30 years back, if you had to go to, say, for example, have a cowboy experience or have an experience with regards to an American outback, then they would normally have themed rooms or stays wherein you can actually have furniture, you know, the in, in interiors of the room and the accommodation that you stay, which is primarily in, in a particular style or uh, representing a particular, you know, era. And those are bits which are coming across as innovations when we talk about, you know, themed holidays. Now, uh, the other things that we want to look at is in terms of um, there is obviously changing tourist behavior. That means people are now looking at cost effective mediums of how they would want to stay and, you know, go on a vacation. Sometimes it involves a combination of travel uh, options. Also, in some cases, it involves, you know, uh, things like um, uh, the tourists being able to you know, when sometimes you hear about concepts like half board or full board. Have you heard about these concepts, half board and full board? So you have full board uh, holidays and you have half board holidays too. Have you heard about this as a concept when you book your recommendations? Full boarding means that you have breakfast, bed, breakfast and pack lunches or evening meals included. And half board is generally bed and breakfast with, uh, you know, mostly in most cases it is bed and breakfast. So sometimes when you book vacations, you're looking at booking vacations, which are, uh, you know, uh, being given or provided as full boarding and half boarding. And that is to look at obviously increasing the revenue that you spend in the destination or in that particular hotel. But in a way, uh, tourists are looking at this behavior is changing because in most cases, people go into France in particular, when you look at Citadines, you know, I think Tulani, you would be able to relate to that. Uh, these hotels typically are self-service so when you when you rent a room uh, in Sydney or uh, those kind of hotels, what will happen is you'll have lots of daily use appliances like the microwave kettle, you know, an iron and a couple of other things which will be made available. So the guests are able to bring in their own meal and obviously do limited or, you know, warming and cooking of things. And that allows to do away with what is called room service or in some cases, you know, full board or half board uh, booking of holidays. So this is basically changing tourist behavior that you can look at. Uh, lots of other things which we spoke about yesterday, which was regarding a new term called be leisure. That means business and leisure combined. A lot of people are traveling today to look at, uh, you know, traveling for business and leisure activities combined. And in those cases, sometimes when you look at booking rooms, what you will generally see is that um, in some cases, this is uh, the option which, uh, you know, different websites or even the hotels would give you an option of to say, if you're traveling for both leisure and, uh, you know, business, then uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, preferential rates or in some cases, because you are booking points through the uh, usage of, uh, uh, you know, as a frequent customer, they will allow you to book uh, rooms at a bit more attractive rate as compared to as a one-off when you are booking it uh, through the portal or through an operator uh, for a one-time stay at the hotel. Now, if we get this basic understanding of what kind of impact changes are happening on the sector, and these are because of innovation, technology, changing consumer requirements, looking at adaptation to travel requirements, uh, you know, looking at integration of technology and AI, there are lots of changes that you are seeing the hotel, hotel industries, resort, tour operators, airlines, uh, you know, and any such ancillary organization which is connected with the tourism and hospitality sector are, are having to grapple with. Now, these changes, if are mandatory in some cases, because uh, if they if the organizations do not adapt or do not uh, you know make these changes, then what can also happen is they have. Uh, they are under threat from competition. They are under threat in terms of uh, not having to 
innovate, which would mean that they are going to get left out, their com competitors are going to go for uh, go ahead. And in those cases, they will end up finally losing revenue or customers that they have worked very hard to maintain or you know maintain that loyal base. Is that okay? Any questions on this so far? Any questions? Okay. okay. Now let's look at um, you know the assessment criteria. So when we talk about the assessment criteria, what we want to do is basically look at understanding the first one, which is talking about how tourism and hospitality organizations are responding to changing trends and factors. Now, obviously, one such example that we can look at as a scenario is that um, assuming uh, you know, looking at the example of Marriott hotels that we took yesterday, if Marriott hotels were to look at upgrading the television sets in each of the rooms in a particular property, let's say 200 rooms in a property in center of Paris, they decide that, you know, it's time for upgrade. We need to have smart televisions, which have access and connectivity to the internet that would allow the hotel to have one, two, three, four advantages. These could be things like uh, personalized welcome messages to the customer in the room, uh, be able to interact and obviously send across details for billings. Uh, it could also, uh, you know, advance the in and in-house entertainment system. And last but not the least, a bigger television would also make them, uh, you know, compete with some of the other properties which are offering uh, this as a this as an advantage or as a highlighting point when you rent a room in the center of Paris, uh, you know, for vacation. So, for example, they might say all our rooms are equi equipped with 42-inch uh, smart internet uh, televisions which would mean that you should be able to browse the internet in your rooms. And that would mean that uh, a lot of activities, a lot of things that you want to look at from a customer's point of view. Um, I've gone to Paris for the first time. I want to look at planning out a holiday for three days or four days, what activities we will do as a family. Then if you have a big internet a TV in the room, using the remote, you are able to scout out the activities that I would do, go out to uh, see the Eiffel Tower, take a city tour, go to La Louvre, go to Lafayette, or for example, uh, go to the outskirts of Paris, uh, you know, look at the restaurants where you would want to dine, uh, go to Champs-Élysées, you would probably look at, you know, also uh, making a trip to Disneyland, but depending on how far is it, it would take probably one and a half hours for you to leave Paris, go to Disneyland, would you prefer a taxi? You know, all this bit of planning could be essentially done if you have access to, a inter access to the internet, but that access to the internet through a smart TV in your, in your uh, room. Now, if they were to look at making this change, what are the various things which the hotel and the hotel management or the you know, staff would need to look at? Say, for example, the management would need to look at. First things first, if I put on the thinking ad right now, what I'm looking at is the couple of things which the hotel management would need to look at. One, they would need to look at what would be outlay in terms of budget that they would need to you know, spend. Then they would also look at things like how and which particular television or vendor do we go across to, how do we get a best deal? Now, in terms, they would also be looking at basing this on, say, for example, a particular uh, uh, model or a business model to say, if we do this upgrade, these are the advantages that we are going to get because of the upgrade. And that would be a part of their strategic plan. But there would be a risk element which will be involved, assuming if they don't have the hotel in full capacity, if, the, if this does not create the required USP or unique selling point, which they are thinking, then in those cases, what will happen is uh, they would risk putting in so much of investment, you know, uh, for upgrading the televisions uh, within the room. So if you had to look at 200 televisions, let's say uh, 500 euros, probably they're looking at spending 100,000 pounds, which is a big expense. And how many days or rooms or additional facilities and services which the hotel would need to look at getting from customers to be able to essentially book this as a profit and recoup this investment. So in such cases, what will happen is they'll be looking at doing what is called risk analysis or risk assessment to see whether this would be uh, you know, ideal at this stage. For example, if hotels were looking at planning this during COVID pandemic, it would have been a bad investment because during COVID, most of the hotels were empty, travel almost came to a standstill. There was no tourism activity whatsoever. And that would have meant a big expense or a big hole in the pockets of the hotel, uh, you know, company, because that upgrade would have had bad timings in terms of planning. And, uh, you know, they would have had no way to recoup that 
particular uh, you know capital spent uh, by upgrading this uh, during that time so in some cases the organizations have to look at risk management and risk management could be in some places because of other factors as well things like recession political unrest uh, you look at terrorism so a couple of years back if you remember during uh, with tourists in morocco tunisia when the arab spring happened in egypt uh, in Sharm el Sheikh, you know, there were a couple of attacks uh, and, you know, a lot of people lost their lives and a lot of governments in Europe, especially UK, France, Germany had to airlift some of their tourists or rest citizens who had gone in as tourists into those places when the Arab Spring actually started. So in some cases, these are events which could also look, uh, which, which also need to be considered when we look at how the, the trends and factors you know are shaping up this industry so risk in general is something which the general manager the hotel or the top management in the hotel they keep uh, you know looking at because of the fact that this is something which is uh, you know important from a point of view of one of the trends which is uh, not in control of the, uh, you know, organization of the business. So they always have to look at risk mitigation and they always have to plan for risk management to be able to stay clear of any uh, present and future uh, conditions or, you know, such issues which could affect the business. The second thing that you will look at is technology integration. And in this case, if the uh, organization does not embrace the changes which are happening in the market, then they have a fear that they'll get left behind. Competitors will, uh, you know, obviously get a better edge or will, will look at taking majority of the business away. And in some cases, this technological integration is mandated because everybody is moving in the industry. The industry is embracing that. So you would need to do it. Like a simple example, which I'll give you outside the THM sector or tourism and hospitality management sector is when you look at when a new technology in mobile phones is introduced. I don't know how many of you recall, but if we go back a few years, when the iPhone was introduced in 2007, the technology at that point in time was 2.5G. And in most cases, some countries in the developing world had edge as a technology. 2.5G gave uh, way to 3G, as we call it, then came 4G, and today we have 5G. Now, that is a change. Basically, what is G? The spectrum at which radio waves are transmitted, and it allows mobile phones to connect and communicate with each other. Now, with the changing technology, what is also happening is that you don't have phones now no longer available with which can work on 3G networks. Correct? So, it is something which the industry itself is moving to, and the innovation is driving uh, te innovation and technological sector is actually driving the industry to move forward. So there are no manufacturers which are selling phones which are 3G or 4G now. Most of the phones in UK and some of the developed countries where the network is available is 5G. So iPhone is introduced a new iPhone 15 and that is a 5G phone. But yes, in countries wherein there is still 4G in developing countries, then is that is where the companies will be looking at only shipping the 3G or 4G I don't think 3G is still available, but 4G product, because in those countries, the 5G spectrum has not been introduced. <clears throat> so when in this case, when we talk about technology integration, things like using a hotel app or a check-in uh, you know, app that you are able to use, which allows you to work um, or you know, use some of the features through the contactless route are increasingly becoming integrated into the services and organizations which are in this particular sector. Similarly, we talk about sustainability initiatives, which is organizations now adopting, you know, uh, ways or practices through which they can minimize waste, energy consumption, eco-friendly tourism option. Now, one of the things that you can think of eco-friendly, um, you know, or energy consumption, which is eco-friendly, where do you think uh, this has been used within the hotels or any such organization? Where do you think it looks at uh, reducing energy consumption. Any idea? Where do you think we can reduce energy consumption in a hotel by doing what or taking what kind of steps? So when we look at energy consumption, where do you think energy consumption can be reduced?
So when we look at now hotels actually deploying sensor-based lights or changing the normal lights into LED lights, or in some cases using efficient uh, or replacing the old equipment, uh, which could be uh, replaced by new equipment, which is more energy, energy efficient, is helping to lower the energy consumption or the carbon footprint for hotels. And that is where you'll generally see you know, sustainability initiatives coming in, like replacement of old. You know. Yes, that's correct. So bulbs, tubes, or, you know, essentially looking at replacing old equipment within the hotels, all those would be looking at, uh, you know, uh, sustainability initiatives. Then one of the things that we have seen during COVID is uh, workforce adaptation. That means in some cases now, uh, because of the changing requirements, of how people want to work. What is happening is the organizations in the sector are also responding to changing demographics of how you know, the workforce is actually working or deployed within this organization. So for example, flexible hours, we're looking at you know, um, concept of uh, you know, uh, shifts, which were already there, but now being planned in a much more effective way so that uh, the hotel is able to retain its own staff and obviously keep uh, you know the staff in, uh, in in place or retain the staff and those are kind of initiatives which the industry or the sector is actually adapting to so that they're able to you know keep the trained workforce for longer within the organization so if you have to draw a meaningful conclusion what we can come across is that most tourism and hospitality organizations are trying to adapt to these changing trends and factors by implementing risk management, by embracing newer technology, prioritizing sustainability, refining their strategies to reach out to customers, and obviously looking at taking you know um, uh, measures to address health and safety and address you know workforce diversity by allowing flexible working uh, patterns or shifts to work more methodically within the uh, organization and this is helping not just to maintain and train and maintain the workforce but also allowing the organizations to uh, uh, you know let's say respond to these changes of trends which are and factors which are contributing to these changes effectively within the sector is that okay yeah okay now let's look at the second assessment criteria which talks about analysis of impact of trends that drive change. So what are we looking at here is how, what are the factors which are driving change first? And how do we then comprehend those factors which are driving change within this sector? So the first part that we want to look at is understand what are the factors which are driving change within this uh, sector. Now, we discussed a couple of points which I've copied through from the previous assessment criteria, things like a changing workforce requirement, which is basically workforce adaptation, then response to the COVID pandemic, environment, sust environmental sustainability, and then obviously looking at the trend of globalization, which means that a lot of companies are now facing increased competition from similar operators or organizations which provide or sell me too products. That means if I book a Marriott hotel or if I go to Hilton hotel, or if I go to, for example, uh, a, a third type of hotel, like a travel lodge or a premier inn, then as a customer, what I'm trying to do is do a comparison to see whether we have, uh, you know, whether I will get the same set of services, which I get, say, for example, in Marriott, or I would get, say, for example, in uh, Hilton. Now, when I look at comparing that, and I come look at comparing that with, say, for example, uh, other hotels, what I would do is do a price comparison, do a feature-based comparison, do a comparison on the um, you know benefits that I would get. And say, for example, things like, do I have an airport pickup and drop service? Is there a 24-hour laundry? Is there a 24-hour coffee shop? Um, is uh, breakfast included in the stay? Um, do I have access to, for example, a business center? And do I get free Wi-Fi within the hotel when I'm, when I'm in the room? Now, in all those cases, what you're generally going to see is that this would be something that would be 
uh, you know, driving uh, the organizations to look at making changes. How do I differentiate my offering at Marriott to the offering in Hilton? And then sometimes customers are able to compare using portals today because they are compare the sites uh, options available. And what the customer can do is essentially go in and obviously, you know, um, uh, compare some of these aspects. And they would essentially mean that, um, you know, um, in this case, they would essentially mean that these are factors which the hotel management or the organization's top leadership would need to consider in terms of helping uh, define these unique selling propositions or USPs as we call it. And that would be what the customers look at in their consideration set when they make a decision for booking the hotel or the property. So in such cases, what we will look at is Globalization is driving increased competition and the rise of online booking platforms, which allow customers to compare properties uh, and then decide which one is the best for them, is making a lot of significant impact in this particular sector. This is happening for airlines. This is happening for insurance. This is happening for hotel bookings. This is happening where you're choosing tour operators. This is happening when you're also booking, you know, resort kind of holidays, when you go in for an experiential holiday or uh, a nature holiday or, you know, a retreat that means you're going in to a specific location. You're going to compare and contrast that with others, uh, other tour operators, airlines, resort or, or holiday makers who are essentially giving or providing similar set of offers. So this comparison which is enabled because of the internet or the internet of things like a website or uh, or a portal weren't present maybe 10 15 years back and that is where you were only dependent on the tour operator or the hotel because you picked up the phone you called the hotel that i'm looking at booking what are the best rates available and you could look at their website you could go to the tour operators which could discount or you know had preferential rates that they had they could provide them but most of these generally were uh, you know, driven through the uh, with, driven through the vendors, which is either tour operators or the uh, you know the uh, hotels. And nowadays, you have the ability to be able to do comparison online just on the website without having to even speak to somebody at the hotel. You are able to book a room without having to speak to the actual hotel for booking, but use an intermediary like Bookings.com or Hotels.com to be able to book places. And these are factors which have contributed to increased competition and globalization, which means that customers today have a lot of choice and that choice allows customers to be able to then uh, look at, uh, you know, uh, deciding on the things which they think are best for them for the purposes of budget and obviously from a point of view of their experience. And these are factors which are driving or having an impact on uh, you know uh, the sector in general, and this is what is uh, asking companies, businesses, organizations within the sector to look at the need for change. Is that okay? Any yeah. question on this? So addressing some of these challenges and capitalizing on emerging trends is essential for long-term success of any such business within this, uh, you know, a sector because it is a services sector and that should mean that, you know, this would be something that the uh, organization operating within the sector has to look at. Now, broadly looking at some of the content which is there also in the learning, uh, you know, outcome. First part was looking at trends. So when we look at trends, we see that people take a lot of frequent holidays nowadays. And in some cases, you would also see people who are able to afford, they have what is called holiday home ownership, which is shared ownership. For example, people in the UK essentially own uh, under shared ownership, you know, houses in, for example, Spain, Portugal, or other places, because this is a vacation or a, spa, a tourist location they go every year. And what they've done is they've looked at a shared ownership and shared ownership allows them to use the properties for a certain time during the year. And that makes it possible there for them to save cost in the long run. So you look at some of the trends, how things are changing within this sector. One is 
people take a lot of holidays now. Instead of taking long holidays in the previous years, if you look at, I think when you look at going back to your school years and my, we used to have 30, 40 days of summer holidays. And obviously our summer holidays used to be at our parents or our grandparents' house. And it used to be a longer uh, you know, vacation, like 20, 30 days used to go and visit by train or you know, by taking a flight and staying there for a couple of days. But now that trend is reversed. What is happening is people are taking more holidays. They want to take a holiday in summer. They want to take a holiday in winter, maybe Easter, or you know, even winter. Some of them, uh, some of them who are able to afford, are able to take holidays uh, multiple number of times during the course of the year. I know a couple of my friends who have a chalet or own a chalet in the Flemish Alps, and obviously they go for a winter holiday there. Um, and you know, these are things which are changing as the lifestyle and technologies uh, are, are changing in our life. What is happening is people are also looking at taking time out because of the fact that they work very hard, the, the, the jobs are quite stressful, or the, you know, in order to look at leisure time or time away from their work, they are looking at now uh, greater flexibility in terms of taking more holidays. Now, other things that you look at is also rise of independent travelers. That means there is a lot of demand now for people who prefer to plan, execute, and travel on their own. We are not having people who would normally nowadays, uh, if I look at 10 years back, I used to plan a holiday by speaking to a tour operator, and they used to manage everything, things like what flights you book, where do you stay, what uh, destinations you go and visit, or with during a vacation, what kind of activities you undertake. But that is now changing because there are costs associated with it. One, to have somebody taken on as a personal, uh, you know, um, a, you know, personal coach who would guide you on all these activities. But people now want to do this exper experimentation and obviously do planning themselves. So there is a rise of what is called the independent travelers happening. Now, there is greater opportunity for adventure and alternate destinations because tourism is now recognized as uh, activity which is primarily undertaken, uh, you know, for various reasons. What people are also looking at is alternate destinations. They want to go to pristine holiday destinations, which means nobody has been to a destination earlier. And then sometimes during pandemics or uh, natural disasters or when we look at uh, you know, the times when obviously uh, there is recession or economic conditions are not good, you would generally see that there's a decline in tourism or tourist related activity. And that could be, uh, you know, obviously detrimental to airlines, uh, you know, hotels, inns and restaurants and uh, bars and other things which are all working within this particular sector. So this is just a bit of a quick recap in terms of, you know, some of the trends. Growth and expansion of airports, obviously air travel becoming much more affordable, cheaper, is allowing people to travel a bit more. Low cost airlines uh, have made it easier for people to travel and take holidays. So those bits are also, you know, having, um, uh, uh, you know, having an impact. And these trends in general can be compounded by economic circumstances, which is, which is within a particular country, um, you know, political unrest, and in some cases, act of God or natural disasters, and they could be, you know, limiting tourism activity or uh, tourism in particular uh, with regards to trends which are shaping, you know, this sector. Is that okay? So these are classified as trends. But when we look at now factors, factors would be, you know, which can have a direct impact and an immediate impact on how travel on tourism, uh, you know, activities can be affected. So factors could be natural disasters like an earthquake or a volcano, or for example, uh, you know, floods, climate change, uh, you know, these are all natural and environmental factors. Then you look at health warnings, epidemics and pandemics. So for example, if there's a global outbreak of cholera or global outbreak of COVID, if there's a new variant which gets discovered, you generally see that these, these uh, bits, you know, will essentially be, um, you know, um, what are called termed as uh, factors which will affect, uh, you know, tourism activity. Then we look at terrorism. This could be an actor, uh, you know, factor which primarily can restrict tourist activities in certain regions. And there are certain regions which are beautiful. There are people who want to go into those places, but 
because of the act of terrorism, sometimes governments issue warnings to avoid, ask citizens to avoid those destinations because there is an imminent, uh, you know, terrorist activity which has been discovered, or there is an act which of terrorism which can happen. And sometimes these governments, you know, ask globally governments ask their citizens to follow their advice and obviously not go into certain countries because of the threat of terrorism. You have things like cost of travel, exchange rate fluctuations. If I look at five years back or before Brexit, you know, one pound was almost 170, 180 to a dollar. But today, after Brexit, the pound has dropped to one, one is to 130 a US dollar. So obviously these things make travel to US a bit more expensive for Brits. But uh, these are impacts which are not beyond, uh, you know, within someone's control. These are economic impacts which are because of the cost of travel, the cost of fuel, or, you know, the exchange rates are changing. And that is where these are factors which could, you know, impact the tourism activity within a particular, uh, you know, tourism activity within this sector. Recession, uh, you look at uh, future factors which could be, you know, slower growth in economies in the G7 or G20. And obviously, in some cases, you know, economic uh, uh, factors which could affect supply chain uh, create shortages for certain types of products or services within the sector could also limit, you know, travel or limit the tourism activity. Is that okay? Any questions on this? No. Okay. So we look at some, uh, so we looked at trends, we looked at factors. Now we let's look at impacts. Now, if the exchange rate is to change, for example, or if there is uh, economic, uh, uh, you know, recession. How would these factors essentially impact tourism activity? That is what we need to look at. So, for example, if there is a recession, you would generally see that tourism activity would decline. Your airlines would see reduced reservations. Hotels would see reduced reservations. And what that would mean is the sector would be looking at bracing, you know, a decline in sales or decline in the output. And that would be one of the impacts of recession uh, on this particular sector. Now, when British Airways uh, staff actually decides to ballot and do balloting action to look at strikes, that means air hostesses, they are asking for more salary, pilots are asking for more salary. And if there is no conclusion or amicable discussion to, to come to a conclusion and the, the staff decide that we are going to take union action and that union action would be balloting and then strikes that would mean the company would start to lose business or you know flight schedules would be disrupted or cancelled and that would mean uh, the strike action of employees would impact the business and the uh, sales of british airways that means they might have to reduce the number of flights they're doing because there's shortage of staff and in some cases you know if this continues for long then this would mean that it would have a significant impact on the revenue for that particular year for British Airways. So similarly, you could look at some of these points to consider factors that could be impacting the industry or the business or organization in this uh, case. Um, you, you would need to look at just taking one or two examples to understand this. And the biggest example that we have as of now in front of us is the COVID-19 pandemic wherein a lot of these organizations within the travel, tourism, and all this hospitality sector had to adapt because the business literally came, uh, came to a standstill. <clears throat> a lot of redundancies were done. And obviously, the industry was supported by the government in most cases, in most countries, in order to tide over this pandemic uh, situation. And that allowed businesses to survive. In some cases, a lot of businesses perished. And as conditions have improved uh, slowly and gradually, what we see is that this is now recovering. And what is happening is that, um, you know, businesses are going back to the pre-COVID stage in terms of driving business or getting business from travelers. Is that okay? Yeah. So that brings us to the end of this particular unit um, with regards to, you know, um, uh, contemporary issues. What, what I'm going to do is obviously look at uh, now doing an assignment discussion. Now, are you available tomorrow? Yeah. 
Okay, so what I will do is, uh, depending on uh, you know the same timing, I'm going to essentially look at now um, send uh, sending you a new invite, and that would be primarily looking at an assignment discussion session for tomorrow. Now, for tomorrow, what I'm going to do is look at, yeah, 11 o'clock should be fine. So I'll send you an invite, just you and um, Nicole, just after the session, so that you are able to then, uh, you know, join us. And then what we will do is complete this particular unit with the discussion on the assignment. Okay. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you so much for attending. And if you think of any questions or if you have any queries, write them down. Because tomorrow when we do the discussion on the assignment, what we'll be able to do is discuss these uh, queries or questions in a bit more detail. And I will get this presentation and the, uh, you know, the links or maybe one or two handouts to study uh, what we've covered today onto Moodle just in a couple of uh, minutes after the session. Okay. Good stuff. Thank you so much for attending and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank, Thank you. you.